you have anything else to say to me, you got to say it now because I'm not going to interrupt myself reading. All right. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, part two of Conjure Wife by Fritz Lieber, uh, originally published in 1943. And uh, yeah, the first segment is already up on YouTube. You can check it out today. Um, and I know most of you haven't checked it out because it's only been viewed like three times. So get out there and listen, will you? All right. Chapter two. <laughs> uh, oh, content warnings. Uh, this is a horror story. I don't actually remember what the horror in it is uh, that you might be concerned about. But if you are sensitive to horror related topics, bear that in mind. Uh, it also has language in it that I would not necessarily use in my day to day life. Um, but I am reading it because that's what's in the story. And I'm going to keep it true to that. Uh, and, and if you have any comments or questions, feel free to add them and, uh, otherwise enjoy chapter two, the red haired woman knew immediately what had awakened her. She made no further movement, but lay there propped on one elbow from the opposite bed came from the opposite bed came placid snores. Presently, although there was no further sound, her eyes were drawn to the blacker smudge of the phone. She lifted it quietly and whispered, Expected you, dear. I was sure you'd feel it too. The other voice came over the wire in bursts, jerky. How couldn't I feel it? Like a great gust of wind, complete compl collapse of protective screen in her quarter. Balance gone. Oh, I told you this would happen. She's up to something. I'll go crazy until I know what. No need to lose your head, whispered the red-haired woman gruffly, eyeing the opposite bed. She's upset the balance, all right, but in a very peculiar way. Any upset I ever heard of came from excessive aggression, unjustified death attempts, or sudden career smashing. But Tansy's done the reverse. Let down her guard. Yes, just a hoodwink us. She's discovered a new weapon. Something bad. Why else would she take such a chance? She's planning to smash us. We've got to beat her to it. Now, now, dear, no tantrums. A third voice was coming over the wires, a sweetly reproving voice, just the short sort to go with silver hair. We mustn't do anything we'd be sorry for. We must be sure of our ground. Do you mean we're just to wait? The jerky voice had grown stridently indignant. When we know she has, she must have a new weapon while she gets ready to smash us. I didn't say we were to wait forever. There was a chilling tingle of tartness in the sweet old voice. I recognize the danger. I recognize also that she has upset the balance and must take the consequences. When we are, su are sure of our ground, we will act. A prospect which I may, sa I may say delights me. And do nothing until then? Yes, dear, except to watch her and him. The red-haired woman smiled grimly, listening to the other two. Such chatterers. The other bed creaked as the sleeper changed position. In any case, she whispered, cutting in, there should be consequences whether we act or not. With the protective screen down, things should begin to happen to her, and especially to him. Things which have been accumulating for a long, long time. And how is Tansy? asked Miss Carr, with such a sweet sol solicitude that for a moment Norman wondered if the silver-haired dean of women had even more of an inside wire on the private lives of the faculty than was generally surmised. But only for a moment. After all, sweet solicitude was the dean of women's stock in trade. We missed her at her last faculty wives meeting, Mrs. Carr continued. She's such a gay soul, and we do need gaiety these days. Cold morning sunlight glinted on her thick glasses and glowed frostily in her apple-red cheeks. She put her hand on his arm. Hempnell appreciates Tansy, Professor Saylor. Norman's, and why not, changed to, I think that shows good judgment, as he said it. He derived sardonic amusement from recalling how five years ago Mrs. Carr was a charter member of the Sailors Are a Demoralizing Influence Club. Mrs. Carr's silvery laughter trilled in the chilly air. I must get on to my student conferences, she said. He watched her hurry off, brisk and erect for all her near, near 70 years, wondering if the sudden friendliness meant that there had been an unexpected improvement in its chances of getting the vacant chairmanship of the sociology department. Then he turned into Morton Hall. 
When he had climbed to his office, the phone was ringing. It was Thompson, the public relations man. A rather delicate matter, Professor Saylor. Delicate matters were Thompson's forte. This morning, one of the trustees phoned me. It seems he had just heard something. I haven't the slightest idea from where, concerning you and Mrs. Saylor, that over Christmas vacation you had attended a party given by some prominent but, um, er, very rowdy theatrical people. I was wondering if... I would issue a denial? Sorry, but it wouldn't be honest. Oh, I see. Well, that's all there is to it, then. Thompson answered bravely after a moment. I thought you'd like to know, though. The trustee was very hot under the collar. Talked my ear off about how these the theatrical people were conspicuous for drunkenness and divorce. He was right. Nice folks. I'll introduce you to them sometime. Oh, yes, replied Thompson apprehensively. Goodbye. The buzzer sounded, terminating the eight o'clock eight o'clock classes. Norman swiveled his chair away from the desk and leaned back, amusedly irritated at, his, at this latest manif manifestation of the Hemphill hush-hush policy. Not that he had made any particular attempt to conceal the Berryman party, which had been a trifle more tempestuous than he had expected. Still, he had said nothing to anyone on campus. No use in being a fool. Now, after three months, it all came out anyway. From where he sat, the roof ridge of Estry Hall neatly bisected his office window along the diagonal. There was a medium-sized cement dragon frozen in the act of clambering down it. For the tenth time that morning, he reminded himself that what had happened last night had really happened. It was not so easy. And yet, when you got down to it, Tansy's lapse into medievalism was not so very much str stranger than Hempnell's gothic architecture, with its sprinkling of gargoyles and other fabulous monsters designed to scare off evil spirits. Sailor's nine o'clock class in primitive societies quieted down leisurely as he strode in a few seconds ahead of the buzzer. He set a student to explaining the sib as a factor in tri tribal organization, then put in the next five minutes organizing his thoughts and noting late arrivals and absentees. When the explanation suppl supplemented with blackboard diagrams of marriage groups had become so complicated that Bronstein, the prize student, was twitching with eagerness to take a hand, he called for comments and criticisms and succeeded in getting a first-class argument going. Finally, the cocksure fraternity president in the second row said, But all those ideas of social organization were based on ignorance, tradition, and superstition, unlike modern society. That was Norman's cue. He lit in joyously, pulverized the defender of modern society with a point-by-point -point comparison of fraternities in primitive young men's houses, down to the actual details of initiation ceremonies, which he dissected with scientific relish, and then launched into a broad analysis of present-day customs as they would appear to be a hypothetical ethnologist from Mars. In passing, he drew a facetious analogy between sororities and primitive seclusion of girls at puberty. The minutes raced pleasantly by as he demonstrated instances of cultural lag in everything from table manners to systems of notation and measurement. Even the lone sleeper in the last row surprised himself by listening. Certainly we've made important innovations, chief among them the scientific method, he said at one point. But the primitive groundwork is still there, dominating the patterns of our lives. We're, mo we've mo we're modified anthropoid apes inhabiting nightclubs and battleships. What else would you, could you expect us to be? Marriage and courtship got special attention, with Bronstein grinning delightedly as he drew detailed modern parallels to marriage by purchase, marriage by capture, and symbolic marriage to a deity. He showed that trial marriage is no mere modern concept, uh, conception, but a well-established ancient custom, successfully practiced by the Polynesians and others. At this point, he became aware of a beet-red, angry face toward the back of the room, that of Gracine Pollard, daughter of Randolph Pollard, president of Hemphill College. She glared at him outragedly, pointedly ignoring the interest taken by the neighboring students in her blushes. Automatically, it occurred to him, Now I suppose the little neurotic will go yammering to Mama that Professor Saylor is advocating free love. He, uh, he shrugged the idea aside and continued the discussion without modification. The buzzer cut it short. 
but he was left feeling irritated with himself and only half listened to the enthusiastic comments and questions of Bronstein and a couple of others. Back at the office, he found a note from Harold Gunnison, the dean of men, asking for an interview. Having the next hour free, he set out across the, he set out across the quadrangle for the administration building. Bronstein still tagged along to expound some interesting theory of his own. But Norman was wondering why he had let himself go. Admittedly, some of his remarks had been a trifle raw. He had long ago adjusted his classroom behavior to hemphenal standards without losing intellectual integrity, and this ill-advised, though trivial, deviation bothered him. Mrs. Carr swept by him without a word, her face slightly averted, cutting him cold. A moment later, he realized the explanation. In his abstraction, he had lighted a cigarette. Moreover, Bronstein, obviously delighted at faculty infraction of a firmly established hemphenal taboo, had followed suit. He frowned but continued to smoke. Evidently, the events of the previous night had disturbed his mind more than he had realized. He ground out the butt on the steps of the administration building. In the doorway to the outer office, he collided with the stylishly stout form of Mrs. Gunnison. Lucky had a good hold on my camera, she grumbled as he stooped to recover her bulging handbag. I'd hate to ha try to replace a lens these days. Then, brushing back an untidy wisp of reddish hair from her forehead, you look worried. How's Tansy? He answered briefly, sliding past her. Now there was a woman who really ought to be a witch. Sloppy, expensive clothes, bossy, snobbish, and gruff. Good-humored in a beefy fashion, but uh, capable of riding roughshod over anyone else's desires. The only person in whose presence her husband's authority seemed a trifle ridiculous. Harold Gunnison cut short a telephone call and motioned him to come in and shut the door. Norm! Gunnison began, scowling. This is a pretty delicate matter. Norman became attentive. When Harold Gunnison said something was a delicate matter, unlike Thompson, he really meant it. They played golf and squash together and got on pretty well. He braced himself to hear an account of eccentric, indiscreet, or even criminal behavior on the part of Tansy. That suddenly seemed the obvious explanation. You have a girl from the student employment agency working for you. Uh, Margaret Van Nees? Norman nodded. A rather quiet kid. Does mimeographing. Well, a little while ago, she threw an hysterical fit in Mrs. Carr's office. Claimed that you had seduced her. Mrs. Carr immediately dumped the whole business in my lap. Well, said Norman. Gunnison frowned and cocked an eye at him. Things like this sometimes really happen, he muttered. Sure, Norman replied. But not this time. Of course. I had to ask. Sure. There was opportunity, though. We worked late and several nights over at Morton, editing stuff. Gunnison reached for a folder. On a chance, I got out her neurotic index. She went, ranks, up way, ranks way up near the top. A regular bundle of complexes. We'll just have to handle it smoothly. I'll want to hear her accuse me, said Norman, as soon as possible. Of course. I've arranged for a meeting at Mrs. Carr's office. Four o'clock this afternoon. Meantime, she's seeing the college ph physician. That should sober her up. Four o'clock, repeated Norman, standing up. You'll be there? Certainly. I'm sorry about this whole business, Norm. Frankly, I think Mrs. Carr botched it. Got panicky. She's a pretty old lady. She's a pretty old lady. In the outer office, he stopped to glance at a small display case of items concerned with Gunnison's work in physical chemistry. The present, uh, the present display was of Prince Rupert, drops in and other high-tension oddities. It occurred to him that Hempnall was something like a Prince Rupert drop. Hit the main body with a hammer and you only jarred your hand, but flick with a fingernail the delicate filament in which the drop ended and it would explode in your face. Fanciful. He glanced at the other objects, among them a tiny mirror, which the, the legend explained would fly to powder at the slightest scratch or sudden change in temperature. Yet it wasn't so fanciful, when you got to thinking about it. Any highly organized, complex, somewhat artificial institution, such as a college, tends to develop dangerous weaknesses, and the same would be true of a person or a career. Flick the delicate spot in the mind of a neurotic girl, and she would explode with wild accusations. Or take a saner person, like himself. Suppose someone should be studying him secretly, looking for the vulnerable filament, finger casually poised to flick. But that was getting, that was really getting fanciful.
Coming out of their 11 o'clock classes, Hervey Sawtell buttonholed him. Hervey Sawtell resembled an unfriendly caric caricature of a college professor. Sometimes he carried two briefcases, and he was usually on his way to a committee meeting. Routine worries chased themselves up and down his nervous face. But at the moment, he was in the grip of one of his petty excitements. Say, Norman, the most interesting thing. I was down in the sacks this morning, and I happened to pull out an old doctor's thesis, 1930, by someone I never heard of, with the title Superstition and Neurosis. He produced a bound, typewritten manuscript that looked as if it had aged without ever being opened. Almost the same as your parallelisms in superstition and neurosis. An odd coincidence, eh? I'm going to look it over tonight. They were hurrying together toward the dining hall down a walk, a walk flooded with jabbering, laughing students. Norman studied Sawtell's face covertly. Surely the fool must remember that his parallelisms had been published in 1931, giving an ugly suggestion of plagiarism. But Sawtell's nervous, toothy grin was without guile. He had the impulse to pull Sawtell aside and tell him that there was something odder than a coincidence involved, and that it did not reflect in any way on his own integrity of scholarship. But this heart seemed hardly the place. Yet there was no denying the incident bothered him a trifle. Why, it was years since he had even thought of that stupid business of Cunningham's thesis. It had lain buried and forgotten in the past, a hidden vulnerability waiting for the flick of the fingernail. Asinine fancifulness. It could, be all, it could all be very well explained to Sawtell or anyone else at a more suitable time. Sawtell's mind was back to routine worries. You know, we should be having our conference on the social science program for next year. On the other hand, I suppose we should wait until... He paused embarrassedly. Until it's decided whether you or I get the chairmanship of the department. Norman finished, Norman finished for him. I don't see why. We'll be working together in any case. Yes, of course. I didn't mean to suggest that... They were joined by some other faculty members on the steps of the dining hall. The deafening clatter of trays from the student section was subdued to a faint din as they entered the faculty sanctum. Conversation revolved among the old familiar topics with an undercurrent of speculation as to what reorganizations and curtailments of staff the new war, the new war year might bring to Hempnell. There was some reference to the political ambitions of President Pollard. It was rumored that he might be persuaded to run for governor or senator. Discreet silences here and there around the table substituted for adverse criticisms of, on this possibility. Sawtell's Adam's apple twitched convulsively at a chance of reference to the vacant chairmanship in sociology. Norman managed to get a fairly interesting conversation going. He was glad that he would be busy with classes and conferences until four o'clock. He knew he could work half again as hard as someone like Sawtell, but if he were compelled to do one quarter of the worrying that man did... Huh. Yet the four o'clock meeting proved to be an anticlimax. He had no sooner put his hand on the door leading to Mrs. Carr's office when, as if that had provided the ne necessary stimulus, a shrill, tearful voice burst out with, It's all a lie! I made it up! Gunnison was sitting near the window, face a trifle... Uh, face a trifle averted, arms folded, looking like a slightly bored, slightly embarrassed, but very solid elephant. In a chair the, in, the, in the center of the room was huddled a delicate, fair-haired, but rather homely girl, tears dribbling down her cheeks and hysterical sobs racking her shoulders. Mrs. Carr was trying to calm her in a fluttery way. I don't know why I did it, the girl bleated pitifully. I was in love with him, and he wouldn't even look at me. I was going to kill myself last night, and then I thought I would do this instead, to hurt him. Or... Now, Margaret, you must control yourself, Mrs. Carr admonished, her hands hovering over the girl's shoulders. Just a minute, Norman cut in. Did you say last night? There, there, dear. I think you better leave, Professor, Sa Professor Sailor. Mrs. Carr's eyes, magnified by thick glasses, looked fish-like. Her attitude was hostile. There's obviously no need of asking questions. I think I should be permitted just at least one, said Norman. Just exactly at what time last night, Miss Van Nice? Niece, did you get this idea? Gunnison registered puzzled but, vaguely curio but vague curiosity. A tear-stained face looked up at Norman. It was just after one o'clock, she said. I had been lying awake in the dark for hours, planning to kill myself, and then in a flash the idea came to me. 
Suddenly, she shook loose from Mrs. Carr and stood up, facing Norman. Oh, I hate you, she screamed. I hate you. Gunnison followed him out of the office. He yawned, shook his head, and remarked, Glad that's over. Never a dull moment, Norman responded, absently. Oh, by the way, Gunnison said, dragging a stiff white envelope out of his inside pocket. Here's a note for Mrs. Sailor. Hulda asked me to give it to you. I forgot about it before. I met her coming out of your office this morning, Norman said, his thoughts still elsewhere. Somewhat later, back at Morton, Norman tried to come to grips with those thoughts, but found them remarkably slippery. The dragon on the roof ridge of Estry Hall lured him away his attention. Funny about little things like that. You never even noticed them for years, and then they suddenly popped into focus. How many people could give you one single definite fact about the architectural ornaments of buildings in which they worked? Not one in ten, probably. Why, if you'd asked him yesterday about that dragon, he wouldn't have for his life have been able to tell you even if there was one or not. He leaned on the windowsill, looking at the lizard-like yet grotesquely anthropoid form bathed in the yellow sunset glow which, his wandering mind remembered, was supposed to symbolize the souls of the dead passing into and out of the underworld. Below the dragon jutting out from under the cornice was a sculptured head, one of a series of famous scientists and mathematicians decorating the entablature. He made out the name Galileo along with a brief inscription of some sort. When he turned back to answer the phone, it suddenly seemed very dark in the office. Sailor, I just want to tell you that I'm going to give you until tomorrow. Listen, Jennings, Norman cut in sharply. I hung up on you last night because you kept shouting into the phone. This threatening line won't do you any good. The voice continued where it had broken off, growing dangerously high. Until tomorrow to withdraw your charges and have me reinstated at Hempnell. If you don't... I told you not to threaten. There were no charges. You just flunked out. If you want to talk it over reasonably, come and see me. The voice at the other end of the line broke into a screaming, obscene torrent of abuse, so loud that he could still hear it very plainly as he was placing the receiver back in the cradle. Paranoid. That was the way it sounded. Then he suddenly sat very still. At twenty past one last night, he had burned a charm supposedly designed to ward off evil influence from him, the last of Tansy's hands. At about the same time, Ma Margaret Van Nice had decided to accuse him of seducing her, and Marvin Jennings had decided to make him responsible for an imaginary plot. Next morning, Harvey Sawtell, uh, Harvey Sawtell poking around in the stacks had found... Rubbish. With an angry snort of laughter at his own credulity, he picked up his hat and headed for home.